Thank you. That's good. Thank you. And welcome inside the Mike Lazaridis Theater of Ideas here at Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. And welcome to this Perimeter's public lecture series. My name is Greg Dick. I'm the Director of Educational Outreach here at Perimeter. And it is a pleasure to welcome everyone here this evening, both those of you here in the live studio audience and to those of you watching online, whether on Perimeter's website or on one of our many science communication colleagues' websites around the globe. Tonight's lecture will last approximately one hour and will be followed by a question and answer session. If you're watching online, Dr. Kelly Foyle, Dr. Stephanie Keating and Dr. Damian Pope and a team of researchers are behind their keyboards at the ready following the Twitter and Facebook feeds. They're ready to answer your questions. So if you wanna join that conversation, please use hashtag PILive. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's very special guest speaker, Dr. Victoria Caspi. Dr. Caspi is a professor of physics at McGill University and also holds the Lauren Trottier Chair in Astrophysics and Cosmology and a Canada Research Chair in Observational Astrophysics. She has held the Hubble Postdoctoral Fellowship at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the California Institute of Technology and was previously an assistant professor at MIT. Professor Caspi has been the recipient of numerous awards and honors throughout her career, and most recently was named the director of the newly created McGill Space Institute. Tonight, Dr. Caspi will tell us how astrophysicists are using neutron stars to study all sorts of issues ranging from the origins of the universe to the nature of matter itself. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Victoria Caspi and her talk the Cosmic Gift of Neutron Stars. Dr. Caspi. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm very excited to be here at the Perimeter Institute and to be talking to you about my favorite astrophysical topic, neutron stars. Uh, and now when you hear the word stars, uh, you know, generally people on the street, if you ask them, you know, what's a star, this is the sort of thing that they get in their head. And I bet this is the first perimeter talk where you've had both Justin Bieber and Lindsay Lohan in the same slide. Um, but of course, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, people more familiar with the field will, of course, picture uh, a beautiful night sky and some of these uh, lovely, uh, you know, many different types, different colors of stars, some really bright that end up saturating detectors. You've seen images like this. Uh, but these kind of stars are also not what I'm going to be talking about tonight. I'm going to be talking about a very different kind of star called a neutron star. And this is an artist concept of what a neutron star would look like if you could get close to it and take a picture, which Unfortunately, they're at interstellar distances. We can't do that. Uh, and what you can see is a, this is meant to show a very compact object, and there's all sorts of other things that are, that are really representative of some of the physics at play on these objects. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a lot more about them uh, in, the course of this, in this course of this talk. But I titled the talk Cosmic, Gifts, Cosmic Gift of Neutron Stars. Why Cosmic Gift? What do I mean by that? Well, they were... Um, discovered serendipitously in 1967, and they continue to amaze people, uh, astronomers, physicists today, and they seem to be a gift that keeps on giving. Uh, they could have been a scientific footnote uh, following their discovery, oh, interesting quirk of nature, how uh, cute, but uh, today they're still studied by hundreds of physicists and astrophysicists worldwide, uh, because they continue to yield surprising and unexpected results on a wide variety of astrophysical and physical topics. In that sense, they're a cosmic gift, and uh, they, I think you should be expecting new gifts uh, from these objects in the future, and I'm hoping to share some of these gifts with you tonight. Uh, so let's start at the end. What do I mean by that? Well, neutron stars are one of the three main endpoints of stellar evolution. Uh, in this diagram, uh, we've uh, split very, very simply, and this is, of course, it's much more complicated than that, but you can think of the vast diversity of stars as really in two main classes. 
uh, an average star, low mass star like our sun, which over the course of its lifetime will uh, evolve, eventually growing into a red giant, expelling its outer layers, and then eventually ending up as a white dwarf star. And we see lots of white dwarfs around our galaxy. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, stars considerably more massive than the sun, we believe upwards of eight times the mass of the sun typically, uh, will also evolve uh, eventually and turn into red supergiants, but will undergo a much more uh, explosive finale, uh, namely a supernova explosion, the result of which is one of two possibilities. One, for the most massive stars, we believe, uh, would be a black hole. And the other is what I'm talking about tonight, a neutron star. So we think neutron stars are the endpoints of stellar evolution for stars that are uh, in the mid-range of masses, somewhere between 8 and perhaps 20, although maybe as high as 30 or even 40 solar masses. We're not really sure about the upper end of what, can, what creates a neutron star versus what creates a black hole. Uh, if you're curious, by the way, since I mentioned it, uh, where the sun is in its evolutionary cycle, it will eventually turn into a white dwarf after several billion years, but we're uh, less than halfway there, so no need to be concerned. Uh, now, the ex supernova explosion that gives birth to the neutron star, it has a, you could think of it uh, in these three steps, where you have this red giant or supergiant star. What happens is the core where the nuclear fusion is occurring in stars that gives it the energy to withstand the inner crushing pull of gravity. This is the, the, the stability of how st all stars are stable by nuclear fusion at the center. But eventually that fuel runs out and gravity wins. And it, it wins from the inside out. You have a core implosion that creates the compact object, be it a black hole or in this case, a neutron star. Uh, and then later the release of energy from that implosion uh, will expel the outer layers of the star and send them at tens of thousands of kilometers per second into the surrounding medium. And you end up uh, at the end of the explosion with the neutron star at the center or thereabouts uh, and a supernova remnant that is expanding interstellar space. This is, and there's many of these objects known in the galaxy uh, and in other galaxies as well they're pretty beautiful. And let me show you one very famous example of a supernova remnant. This is the Crab Nebula, uh, the remnant of an explosion that happened, we know, in 1054 AD. It was actually recorded uh, by uh, several, many separate cultures uh, who were very interested at the time in astrology. <laughs> they had uh, the king, the emperors had uh, uh, astrologers who watched the night sky for prognostications of political events on Earth, so these, this is recorded by the Chinese, by the Japanese, by the Koreans. Uh, that's one explosion that happened in our galaxy, and when it went off, it was as bright as the full moon uh, for several weeks. And this could happen again in our, this, these things we think happen uh, roughly once or twice per century in our galaxy, although many of them are hidden by dust, you can't see them. If you're wondering if there's any likelihood of one going off anytime soon, we're actually due. Uh, the last one that was recorded uh, s several hundred years ago now, th about 300 years ago, and uh, uh, we are due for one, and one possible star that's been pointed at as a candidate for a supernova any, any day now, any, any day or 100 years or in 1,000 years, 10,000 years. <laughs> Remember, we're talking astrophysical timescales. If it happened tomorrow, we wouldn't be surprised. If it happened in 10,000 years, it would be about the same thing because stars evolve on timescales of millions and tens of millions of years, so 10,000 is a blink of an eye to a star. Uh, but you might be familiar with this constellation. It's the constellation Orion, and the star I'm talking about that seems likely to blow any time is Betelgeuse, the big uh, red supergiant star uh, up there. And just in case you're curious, you know, supergiant star, sometimes astrophysicists seem so, you know, want to exaggerate effects so much, but you know, <laughs> there's a reason we call it uh, supergiant. It's really much, much larger uh, than the sun. Uh, but just coming back to the Crab Nebula for a moment, as a supernova remnant, this gas has been actually observed uh, by taking uh, very precise photographs of it 
uh, over many years, it is expanding, but uh, there's lots of stars in the field here, and uh, al uh, then almost all of them are totally unrelated. They're either in the foreground or in the background, but there's one star here near the center that is intimately related with the supernova remnant. Uh, at the center, now this is another view of the Crab Nebula, at the center of the uh, Crab Nebula is the neutron star that was left behind by the supernova explosion, and this particular neutron star is a pulsar. Uh, it's a remarkable object. This is the, the kind of object I spent a lot of time studying. Uh, this is now um, a series of images taken at very high speed of those two central stars, one of which is just a regular you know, solar-type star, and you can see that's the one that is, that's always on. Whereas there's another one, if you look at this image, and the time goes down through these columns, and by the way, this entire time sequence lasts 33 milliseconds, that's 33 thousandths of a second, you can see the other stars turning on and turning off and turning on and turning off. And that's, that's the pulsar. That is a, it's pulsating, you think it's pulsating, turning on and turning off very, very uh, rapidly. And this the particular crab pulsar pulsates 30 times every second. 30 times every second. Now, when I say pulsar, you might be picturing uh, something pulsating, getting larger and smaller, and that's not what we believe um, neutron stars do. This is the cartoon picture of a neutron star. Uh, we can't, of course, ever make a picture like this. We can't get close enough to these objects. I'll explain, they're actually really small. Uh, but uh, the idea here is that these are like cosmic lighthouses. So the neutron star is rotating about an axis, and this cartoon is vertical but has magnetic poles uh, where the magnetic axis is misaligned with the vertical axis. And out of the magnetic poles are emerging beams of light that we then observe once per rotation if we're fortuitously located in the galaxy. And you can immediately see from this cartoon that we probably miss uh, many, many pulsars in the galaxy just from our vantage point. If you went to some other planet and around some other star in the galaxy, you'd see a different sky of pulsars. Uh, so I said we don't ever see a picture like this. What we record typically uh, are intensity variations. So what we see is the intensity of the light uh, brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer periodically, regularly, uh, sort of like this, this cartoon down here. Now, um, observing pulsars through a quirk of nature uh, that has to do with, uh, the, way part, uh, with the way the um, magnetic field configuration is around the neutron star. Uh, they like to produce radio waves. So radio waves are like any kind of light. You know, we think of light as what we can see and how you're seeing me right now, but actually radio waves are just a different form of light, different, we call it a different wavelength. And for some reason, pulsars, they also, also produce some optical light that you can see. Uh, but the vast majority of them are observed most easily through radio waves using giant radio telescopes like this telescope here, the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. The size of this dish here is uh, 100 meters. 100 meters, so just for scale, this is a, a large building here, and you can see a few cars down there. It's, this is the largest steerable radio telescope in the world. And when you go to this telescope, the radio waves come in, they reflect off the surface of the telescope and go into this receiver over here that is then connected to sensitive electronics that can record the intensity of the radio waves digitally onto uh, computer disks. And then, with software, we analyze the data and we s measure the radio intensity versus time, and we refer to the time between successive pulses as the pulse period. And this is actually some real radio data that we collected at the Green Bank Telescope, and, and the truth is that um, this is, I like to say this is typical, and I wish this was typical because this is a really bright pulsar <laughs> where you could see every single pulse. Most pulsars are not like that, as I'm going to demonstrate shortly. Uh, here's another schematic diagram of the pulsar. I wanted just to point out a couple of other features that we talk about that are going to come up later in the talk. I wanted to mention, so there's a, I mentioned already the rotation axis that's represented by the vertical line, the magnetic axis here at about, so I don't know, 45 degrees 
uh, the beams of radiation that are coming out of the magnetic poles, and this green shaded region is called the magnetosphere, uh, and this is a, a region where magnetic field lines form this sort of donut shape, donut shape, and, and that's, I'm just mentioning that because it's going to come back uh, later in the talk. Now, you might ask, you know, the crab pulsar rotates 30 times per second. That's pretty fast. It's not typical of the population. If you look at the more than 2,000 pulsars that we know of in the galaxy now, uh, the slowest one is actually about eight seconds. Uh, the fastest one, as I'm going to describe, rotates uh, several hundreds of times per second. And you might ask, you know, how do they get to be rotating this fast? How does a star <laughs> get to spin so rapidly? And it's thanks to the principle of conservation of angular momentum, which is a physical principle where something is rotating, but then that angular momentum that it has is conserved. It has to stay the same no matter what the configuration of the object is. So if the object gets smaller, it spins up. If the object grows, it spins down. And there's a beautiful movie here by a figure skater, uh, US silver medalist Paul Wiley, uh, from uh, doing a spin, and what you're going to see is he spins himself and makes himself as large as he can by extending his arms and legs, and then brings his leg and arm in, and thanks to conservation of angular momentum, he spins himself up to incredible speeds. And, uh, you know, <laughs> if he, if he, he could have done it even better if he could have extended himself even more and raised both legs at the same time, but unfortunately, that doesn't work out so well. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, you get the idea that the project it's the same with a star. All stars rotate. The sun rotates roughly every 29 days. When you have the star and it ends up collapsing into the neutron star, any angular momentum that that progenitor star has prior to the supernova is conserved, and that's how the compact remnant, the neutron star, can spin so fast. And you might wonder what that has to do with this image here of the Garden of Eden, and that's because I'm explaining original spin. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so just a few basic neutron star facts. I've mentioned some of these already. A uh, neutron star, the mass, it's quite massive, typically 40% times more massive than the sun, and that's not as intuitive a number uh, for everybody, so uh, if you want it in uh, Earth masses, it's about half a million Earths. That helps you out. If you take half a million planet Earths, but you take all that matter and you crush it into the size of a city, uh, so the typical neutron star radius, we think, is about 10 kilometers. Uh, so here, it's, here it is relative to the island of Montreal, where McGill University, where I'm from. Uh, so it's, you know, not that large a distance. So when I say they're small, I mean by stellar standards, they're, they're tiny. Uh, so you have to imagine all that matter crushed into the size of a, of a sphere of 10 kilometers. That's, that's a huge uh, density extremely high density, so that if you went up to a neutron star, took a teaspoonful, of w it would weigh a billion tons. So it's not matter like we know of. Uh, this is neutron star matter, where the space between atoms, normally the atom, where the electrons are buzzing around the nucleus, most of it is space. What we're made of is mostly space. In a neutron star, the gravity has crushed all the space out of, out of the atoms and uh, left behind something of incredible density. And on top of this, as I said, they rotate very, very fast, with the fastest one rotating 716 times per second. So you have to, oh yeah, <laughs> sorry, McGill plug there, there is McGill University on the island of Montreal. Uh, so you have to imagine uh, something 1.4 times the mass of the sun crushing the size of a city, rotating as fast as your household blender. So just to set the scale, and um, you know, sometimes at night I do a little web surfing. I was really curious about this statement and wondering how do we compare actually to the world's fastest blender? And I, uh, <laughs> so I discovered the Vitamix 5000, which apparently is really good for smoothies. Um, Max is out at 625 rotations per second. So the fastest pulsar beats the fastest blender on Earth, and I'm <laughs> very happy about that. 
Uh, and um, the, this fastest pulsar actually was discovered by then graduate student, there's Jason Hessels on supercomputers at McGill University in 20, 2006. And the search continues. So we continue to look for ever faster pulsars. Uh, and you could ask, well, you know, you know, why do we want to do that? Well, is it just to set speed records? No, it's not the only reason. And uh, this is the only equation I'm going to include, include in this part of this presentation. Uh, you have to, when you think of 716 rotations per second, you have to imagine what it would be like to be standing on the sur surface of that star. How fast would you be going if you're standing on the equator? So it's very not too complicated to calculate that. So I thought I'd include just one simple calculation. Here's the velocity you would be moving if you were standing on the equator, and that's equal to the, the distance around the equator, which is the circumference of a circle, 2 pi times the radius, divided by the time it takes to go around once, which is what we call the period of the pulsar. And so 2 pi times 10 kilometers, cast into meters there, 10,000 meters, divided by the period of one of these super fast pulsars, uh, that works out to about 15% of the speed of light. So there's velocity, and that is called very fast. It's a technical term for it. Uh, and it's the sort of thing that would, you know, gives you a moment of pause, because Einstein's theory of relativity says that the speed of light is a cosmic speed limit. Nothing should be able to go faster than that. And so one of the very interesting questions that we're trying to answer in searching for more of these objects uh, is how fast can a pulsar spin? Because if we can find one spinning you know, a little bit faster, we're gonna, it looks like we'll start violating uh, some pretty important laws of physics. Now, of course, there's a, a little bit, it, it's not, ex I'm, I'm, I'm not telling you the full truth, because what you should note is, first of all, while we know the periods of these pulsars extremely well from our radio telescope observations, the radius here, that's more squishy. That's a number where it has a larger uncertainty, and in fact, by finding ever faster pulsars, what we're really going to be doing is constraining that radius, uh, and that will um, teach us exactly what the radius of the neutron star is depends on what's going, how, how the star is constructed, how, what, what the star is made out of. Uh, and that tells us about the interiors of neutron stars. So when I talk about matter being compressed so that all the electrons are smushed together with the protons to produce neutrons, you have a giant bag of neutrons, extremely high densities. The truth is that we really don't understand matter at such high densities. We believe the centers of neutron stars have densities upwards of 10 times the density of the atomic nucleus. And that's why, you know, in this diagram of the structure of neutron star, there's lots of things on the exterior of the neutron star or toward the outer regions of the star that they're fairly well understood, but there's a giant question mark at the center. And so by finding ever faster pulsars, we're hoping to constrain the nature of ultra-dense matter. Some of the searches that we do uh, for these pulsars involve the world's largest radio telescopes. I showed you the Green Bank Telescope before. Uh, we also use the Arecibo Telescope in in Puerto Rico, this diameter here is 300 meters. Uh, it's 300 meters. It's um, the largest radio telescope in the world. And uh, just so you can see, this here is a wonderful science, three-story science center where you can go and, and see uh, all sorts of things. These are huge towers and huge cables that support this, um, uh, the antenna here that's uh, uh, several hundred feet above the ground. And um, this is also quite famous because it's been in several uh, popular movies. Uh, so there is uh, Jodie Foster with the Arecibo uh, antenna feed structure there in, in the background. This was part of the uh, major motion picture contact. With, there's Jodie Foster with Matthew McConaughey, who seems to like to do astrophysics movies, at least uh, recently he's been in a, uh, another great movie, Interstellar. And this move, the Arecibo telescope also was featured in a James Bond movie, uh, James Bond Goldeneye, starring Pierce Brosnan. Uh, and I'm just mentioning this because in this scene, uh, there's a scene where he, he runs on this catwalk. This here is a catwalk where you can walk up to the feed structure and stand on it and stuff. And uh, Pierce Brosnan, uh, um, his stunt double did it because he, he was uncomfortable walking on that. And I've walked on that a million times, so I've done things that James Bond was too afraid to do. <laughs> 
And, and just to show you that, to prove it, uh, <laughs> There, there I am with my uh, Pulsar colleagues, uh, Professor Maura McLaughlin from West Virginia University and Dr. Paul Ray from the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. And you can see we're at the top of that, that catwalk over here. And if uh, we're smiling, but if you zoom in, you'll see our knuckles are absolutely white because it's really terrifying up there. Uh, and by the way, the data we collect using Arecibo on computer disks and we analyze on supercomputers at McGill University uh, actually is also sent to a program called Einstein at Home. I just wanted to mention this, uh, where uh, everybody, you can help find pulsars. You can go to this website and download the software. And in fact, in 2010, uh, the first pulsar was found by non-astronomers thanks to the Einstein at Home program. And there you can see uh, the, the lucky discoverers. And here's a little bit of information about the pulsar. So I encourage you, uh, if you're interested in this sort of science, in your spare CPU cycles, you can analyze pulsar data. Uh, yeah, so now, back to the fastest pulsar. Uh, when we first discovered it, it was written up in Science Magazine, an article by Harvard professor Jonathan Grinley. Uh, and the title of his article describing our work was A Neutron Star in F Sharp. And you might wonder, F Sharp, that sounds like music. What does music have to do with neutron stars? So let me tell you. You know, you record these signals with giant radio telescopes and receivers and amplifiers. You can take the output of those amplifiers and either just record it digitally onto disk, or you can feed it through a speaker and listen to it. And so I've brought with me some sounds from actual radio pulsars, real pulsar data. Uh, I'm going to play for you the first one. These are the pulse periods. So you can get a feeling for these sounds. This is pulsar 0329 plus 54. So this pulse period is about 0.7 seconds, uh, so a little faster than once per second. The next pulsar is a very, is much faster pulsar, 89 milliseconds or 11 hertz. It's a pulsar in the constellation of Vela. Oops. Oh, hang on. Oh, there we go. Now, this is a much faster pulsar. You can hear pulse-to-pulse -pulse modulation. The amplitude of the individual pulses is not constant. Sometimes we'll even hear a pulse is missing. The next one always comes back exactly in phase. There are excellent clocks in that sense. So the different ticks of the clock might have different intensities in radio, but they always come in on time. The next one is actually the crab pulsar, 33 milliseconds. This is actually a simulation because the supernova remnant this one's embedded in produces tons of radio noise. It's hard to pick out the signal from all that radio noise, so we've simulated it. And now this noise is getting to be, for some of you, a little bit annoying in the sense of uh, kind of a buzzing. And some of you might not even be able to distinguish the individual uh, pulses. It's very close to what is possible to be distinguished, to, to, to hear actually hear separated pulses. The last one is a really fast rotator, 1.5 seconds. This is uh, the second fastest pulsar known. And what you're going to hear is now, this is very much uh, in the audio range. So now we're really talking music. Uh, to those of you who are um, music aficionados, this is not a perfect tone. It has higher harmonics. Uh, this, in other words, the pulse the average pulse shape is not sinusoidal, it's actually narrower. Uh, and you can understand now why they're called, uh, they produce, you could think of them as uh, uh, neutron stars in F-sharp. Um, now, it so happens the fastest pulsar that we found is in a star cluster, as a globular cluster, in this case, the globular cluster Terzan 5. And it turns out this globular cluster is home to many, many pulsars to a wide variety of these, uh, of these, and especially to really fast rotating pulsars. Uh, roughly 30 of them are in the cluster that are known so far. And what I thought I would just bring to you is the music of the globular cluster Terzan 5, where we've now simulated the different millisecond pulsars, each with its own frequency, each with its own tone, and at the end, you're going to hear the whole swarm to really get 
the effect of what this uh, cluster holds. Okay, here we go, the music of Turzan 5. Music from the heavens. Uh, and by the way, a lot of those pulsars were found by this pulsar geek, whose name is Scott Ransom, who's such a geek, he put pulsars on his license plate. Uh, and now, one thing about these cluster pulsars is that nearly all of these pulsars uh, in this cluster, and actually nearly all of the really fast rotating ones, are in what we call binary systems. So what is a binary pulsar? A binary pulsar is when the pulsar orbits another star. So in the process of the supernova explosion, somehow the progenitor star, which had to have been in a binary, gets to keep, stay with its binary companion, and we end up with a pulsar orbiting another star. Now, as I mentioned, these pulsars, you know, I mentioned when we were playing the Vela pulsar, how you different pulses have different amplitudes, but some are even missing, but the next one always comes back in phase. And you can set your watch to these things. They're incredibly precise. And in fact, some of them are uh, really uh, unprecedentedly preci precise clocks. And let me explain what I mean by that. This particular pulsar, I played you the beautiful tone of it earlier, uh, its pulse period on this particular day was, can be measured very, very precisely because the ticks are so regular. And of course, you have to observe it for quite a while in order to make this kind of precision measurement. But this is the sort of precision we can make on the period. So it's not just 0.0015. It's with all of these digits where this digit in parenthesis is the uncertainty on the number, the error on the number, which is in the last digit. So these pulse, some of these pulses, not all of them, some are not so good clocks, but some of them are really, really superb clocks. And in fact, pulsars as clocks can be comparable to the world's best atomic clocks. So having a pulsar is having this little cosmic, superb clock in the sky, especially when you find it orbiting another star, uh, it can allow you to make really sensitive measurements of dynamics, of how, those star, of how the star is moving. And that's thanks to an effect called the Doppler shift, which is uh, explained here in this, uh, in this uh, figure, where you have to imagine a car traveling uh, in this direction, and you have to imagine the driver who's sitting in the car sounds the horn, and it makes some noise like honk, and that's the sound that the driver hears. Now, you imagine an observer over here behind the car, and if the car is uh, moving away from that observer, that observer is going to hear a slightly different tone of that horn, a little lower honk, whereas an observer standing uh, in the direction the car is moving, here's honk, a little higher uh, note. And this is the same as the train whistle effect. If you're standing near the train tracks and the driver toots the whistle, you hear like that. And uh, of course, the effect is greatest if you're exactly along the line of motion of the car, which is great for observer one, but wouldn't be so good for observer two. Uh, and of course, the Doppler shift uh, is what's used uh, by police to record the speed of your car by bouncing waves and seeing the change in frequency off the, from the velocity of your car. Uh, and so the same thing happens in binary stars. When you have stars in orbit around each other and you're observing them with a telescope, one is moving towards you, and so the frequencies that it emits are a little bit, we call it blue shift, there is the slightly higher frequency, whereas when the star is moving away from you, the frequency is shifted a little redward, that is, to lower frequency. 
And actually, you can observe that phenomenon in typical stars, too, by looking at their, at their spectrum. I'm not going to talk about that. Instead, I'm talking about when you have one of those stars being a pulsar, the pulse period of the system is like your car horn. And by measuring that pulse period, as the star moves away and toward you, away and toward you, in its binary orbit, you can study the motion with exquisite precision. So let me show you what I mean. Here is uh, the pulse period of a pulsar measured as a function of time. And these little dots here are the actual measurements, with error bars included. And this is showing you uh, the best how we go about describing the data. Uh, it's showing you that when a pulsar is in a binary, we, because we can measure the periods with such precision, uh, it's a huge effect. The motion in the binary is a really, really strong effect. And this is a, a circular orbit, where it looks like a perfect sine wave. Uh, and here's a, a pulsar, and again, the points are indicated with error bars, and you can see it's very non-sinusoidal. That's a very eccentric, a very elliptical orbit. So as you can see from the precision of these, the periods of the pulsars, we can measure orbits uh, with great precision. And uh, this is what allowed these two gentlemen, Russell Hulse and Joe Taylor, uh, to be, this is what made them so ha makes them so happy in this picture here. Uh, they were the f first people to discover a binary pulsar, the first binary pulsar discovered in 1974, pulsar 1913 plus 16, which, by the way, they're named for their coordinates in the sky. Uh, they found a pulsar orbiting in this case, and this is actually fairly rare, they were really lucky, uh, another neutron star. Uh, and not only that, it was orbiting the other neutron star every eight hours. So you have to think about the Earth's orbit around the sun that takes about a year, <laughs> it takes long, compared to every eight hours. So three times a day, this pulsar is uh, uh, orbiting uh, the second neutron star. And you know, so I, I refer to that as highly relativistic. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, the Earth's orbit around the sun that is, uh, can be de well described quantitatively by classical dynamics, such uh, like those uh, that were described by Isaac Newton here, and you know, are fairly straightforward to do. We could teach this. I teach this in uh, first year mechanics uh, in university. On the other hand, when you're moving at speeds, the orbital velocity of that pulsar eight, orbiting eight hours a day is an appreciable fraction of the speed of light. Newtonian classical dynamics breaks down. And you need to invoke relativistic dynamics uh, by this gentleman here, Albert Einstein. Uh, and of course, the mathematics get a little more sophisticated, but it's very fairly well understood and um, uh, something that you can hope to observe in these systems. And one of the major predictions of Einstein's theory of general relativity is that the pulsar orbit should decay. So in Newtonian mechanics and classical dynamics, when an object orbits another object and gravity's operating, it orbits it forever. Nothing ever changes, it's unchanging. Whereas in relativistic uh, mechanics, something happens called the emission of gravitational waves, which here is depicted through this imaginary green grid that's drawn on the space-time surrounding these two masses. And in general relativity, the orbit, that motion of those masses, causes ripples of gravitational waves to be sent outward, extracting energy from the system and eventually leading to the decay of that orbit. So this is a major prediction of general relativity. And so uh, one of the reasons these gentlemen are uh, smiling is because the discovery of the first binary pulsar allowed a very sensitive test of general relativity. They could ask the question, was Einstein right? Is the orbit actually decaying? Uh, and you know, Einstein's great, and, uh, but in science, we test our hypotheses, and even one that was described much earlier than the discovery of the binary pulsar still uh, you know, absolutely needs to be tested. It's been tested in weak field regimes in the solar system where the effect is really a tiny perturbation, not in a system where there's an orbit every eight hours with two uh, neutron stars. So Einstein isn't necessarily right in the, most, uh, in the strongest regimes. We just, it has to be tested. Uh, but in fact, uh, this is the iconic plot from the uh, binary pulsar, where it shows as a function of time now in many years, uh, the, the uh, data points, again, with error bars indicated. And this is a measure, you could think of it um, as a, a measure of the size of the orbit. 
it's, it's akin to that, it's not exactly it, but you could think of it as that. And if Newton's laws held for the binary pulsar, the data points should all lie on that horizontal line at the top of the plot. And if general relativity is correct, the data points should all lie along this curved, curved line, and you can see where the data points with error bars indicated lie so beautifully. Uh, and it was for this beautiful result and beautiful confirmation quantitative confirmation at about the 1% level of general relativity uh, that Halston Taylor awarded the Nobel Prize uh, in uh, 1994. Now, this question of is general relativity right, uh, it's a cornerstone of modern science, as, as, I, as everybody knows, and it demands testing. And we know it passes weak field tests, and Einstein knew it passed weak field tests uh, with flying colors. In the binary pulsar, it also um, has passed tests, but even that, you know, I was talking with physicists here at Perimeter today and uh, discussing how, you know, even in the binary pulsar, that is nowhere near as strong as gravity can get, and in the strongest regimes we can imagine, at the t near the time, you know, those two neutron stars, the orbits decaying, they're eventually going to merge. Near the time of the merger, when the gravity is incredibly strong, that, we don't know if general relativity is going to work there. The st really strong field regime where GR really matters is still not that well tested. Uh, now, I have to mention that there's another wonderful pulsar system that has provided some interesting tests of general relativity. Uh, this is the double pulsar system, uh, which actually we found two pulsars. <laughs> orbiting each other. So in the Hulse-Taylor pulsar I mentioned, it was a pulsar with another neutron star. The other neutron star, for some reason, is not a pulsar. We don't know why. People keep looking. It's not. Uh, in fact, an all, we, we know something like a dozen double neutron star binaries. In only one case is the other neutron star also a pulsar. Uh, so in this case, uh, in the double pulsar, we got incredibly lucky. Uh, because not only are both neutron stars pulsars, uh, but the orbital period is incredibly short, 2.4 hours, so way shorter than the Hulse-Taylor binary. And if that's not enough, it's like, you know, as an astronomer, and, you know, I spend a lot of time searching for pulsars, and if you could just like make a checklist, or like you're ordering a pizza, you know, what do you want on your pizza? What kind of binary pulsar do you want? Well, I'd like a relativistic one, yeah, sure. I'd love two pulsars, yeah, great. I'd really also like it to be in an orbit that is viewed exactly edge on. You know, the orbits, uh, of, of stars in the sky, how you view them, you could be seeing them face on, you could be seeing them edge on. Edge on would be really nice to have also. And this pulse, this system is within one degree of being viewed edge on, and that is a spectacular cosmic gift. I don't know what humanity did to be so lucky as to have this object in the sky, but there it is. Uh, and so what happens in the system, and this is a sort of animation where you can see the double pulsar out there, and here's a a zoom in of the two pulsars. One is one rotates much faster than the other, so they're not the same period. One is 22 milliseconds, the other is uh, about two and a half seconds, so one's much slower. Uh, but as you zoom in, what you see uh, is that one pulsar, because the we call it the inclination angle, the orbit, because we're viewing the orbit so exactly edge on to within one degree, one pulsar actually eclipses <laughs> the other pulsar. Uh, for about 30 seconds each 2.4-hour orbit. And um, I mention it because it's, it's not actually the physical edge of the star that's doing the eclipsing, it's the magnetosphere around it that's doing the eclipsing. And that's, uh, I showed you the green donut before, now here it's represented in blue. This is the magnetosphere of the pulsar, location of very intense magnetic fields that actually end up eclipsing the, uh, pul so this is pulsar B passing in front of pulsar A. And it's these beautiful, we see these eclipses, each orbit, that have allowed a novel test of general relativity that I'm going to show you. Um, this was work done uh, by a PhD student at McGill University, this double pulsar. It's an unparalleled lab for GR, and we can use, as I say, the eclipses of pulsar A by pulsar B to study B's orientation in space. Because another prediction of general relativity is that the orientation of spinning objects as they move in, or in orbit should change with time. And so that's the effect we were looking at, a precession. Uh, the, the, orbital, the orientation of B should change with time if general relativity is correct. And this is, what, this is an eclipse profile that we measured here. This is showing you the intensity of pulsar A uh, during the time of the eclipse. So the intensity is, is average, is nominal, it's at one, just before the eclipse, then it goes into the eclipse. 
And what we saw is something really surprising. Pulsar A actually turns on for brief amounts of time during the eclipse. There's these little spikes where Pulsar A is back, and then it fully comes out of the eclipse. And what's amazing is that these little spikes are at exactly half of B's period, and then exactly at B's period. And let me explain, show you why this is. This is something unexpected. We were shocked by this, uh, very excited. And it's this uh, study of these eclipses that led to, there's, there's uh, René Breton, who was then a graduate student at McGill University. Um, oops, again, my thing doesn't like to show the movies. Why? Uh, okay. So he produced this movie showing relativistic spin precession uh, in the uh, double pulsar system. And here, pulsar B is in front, and it's, he rainbow colored the magnetosphere, I don't know why. Pulsar A's magnetosphere is not shown, but you can hear its hum. It's 22 hertz, so that's the hum. As B is rotating, you can see sometimes the magnetosphere is eclipsing and sometimes isn't. And what's down here is what this model would predict for the intensity of A's emission. So it's nominal, goes into eclipse, and then each time B is orient B's magnetosphere is oriented just right, you could see a little bit of the emission sneak through from pulsar A. And so it has to do, so, so the geometry of pulsar B's spin axis and magnetic axis determine this eclipse profile. And by observing these eclipses over many years and seeing these lines move around, uh, d depending on the geometry of B's spin axis, we were able to measure the motion of B's spin axis and show that it exactly agreed with what uh, Albert Einstein had, uh, what Einstein's theory had predicted. So it's a, a very different kind of use, and unfortunately it's a, it's a great cartoon, but uh, it only works in one system. We need another, we need another double pulsar. And just coming, <laughs> so we're working on that. Now just coming back to the binary pulsar system, you know, I talked about how Hulse and Taylor, uh, you know, found the pulsar, and then later um, it could be shown that the neutron stars were moving together due to the emission of gravitational waves, these ripples in space-time that here are represented by the green grid. So they're producing gravitational waves. But what's amazing is that, uh, yeah, so as I said, general relativity predicts gravitational waves, uh, and that is a, a, the detection of the decay of the orbit in the double pulsar shows that that is, has to be happening, but those gravitational waves themselves were not measured directly. They're inferred to be there from the decay of the binary. Uh, but we are hoping to be able to detect gravitational waves directly, and there's uh, instruments that are built and operating today, like the advanced LIGO interferometer, uh, that could revolutionize astronomy and provide a new window on dark objects that only produce gravitational waves, such as black holes, merging black holes. That's the sort of thing the LIGO uh, could detect. Uh, merging neutron stars as well, but those would have some light signature. And I think uh, lots of physicists in the room would agree that LIGO is an amazing experiment that's very likely to yield some interesting fruit soon. And we certainly hope so. But as I said, neutron stars are gifts. They're the gifts that keep on giving. Pulsars can be the sources of gravitational waves, as I described, but amazingly, thanks to the tremendous precision, thanks to the, uh, their, their amazing clock-like properties, like LIGO, they can also be detectors of gravitational waves. Uh, so the pulsar signals can be affected by the passage of gravitational waves between Earth and the pulsar. And because they're such good clocks, even a tiny gravitational wave can affect the observed periods of those pulsars. So these pulsar signals can be affected by sources of gravitational waves. One source, so, so, so now we're thinking of pulsars as detectors, and you can ask, well, what sort of objects could pulsars detect? Uh, we can hope to detect uh, one object that's expected to be there, or one class of objects expected to be out in the sky, merging supermassive black holes. And that sounds so interesting. What's a merging supermassive black hole? So let me tell you. So first of all, at the center of every galaxy, here's a, a picture of our galaxy. Of course, it's, it's not really a picture of our galaxy. To take a picture of our galaxy, we'd have to leave the galaxy. You can't take a 
picture of the outside of your house if you're standing inside of it. So this is uh, artist concept of a picture of our galaxy, and uh, you know we're somewhere out here. The center of our galaxy is where uh, we believe there is a supermassive black hole that is a black hole that has something like three million times the mass of the sun. And there's lots of observational evidence to support that. And we actually believe that there's a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy. And some galaxies have much more massive black holes, sometimes billions of solar masses. So we think every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at the center. Uh, here are some sort of pictures. This is actually an optical image. Uh, optical combined with radio and x-ray, because that way you can see some of the interesting features. Uh, together, this is the galaxy Centaurus A, where we see a dust disk that's sh signaling so probably the orientation uh, of the black hole spin, and these amazing jets that seem to be coming out from the black hole. This is the sort of artist concept showing you um, what one of these galaxies, we believe, with a central black hole that's a little bit obscured. Uh, but we think every galaxy has one of these black holes, and that sometimes galaxies collide. So when I say merging supermassive black holes, what I mean is in galaxy collisions, like we think is happening uh, in this optical image of these two galaxies uh, that are called the mice, because they have these tails, uh, we think this is actually a collision in the process, right in the middle of happening. And the reason we think that's a collision of two galaxies is because uh, we do uh, simulations of colliding galaxies, a computer simulation of two spiral galaxies colliding. Uh, and in the computer, what you can see is that uh, you can reproduce the observational images. You see an image that looks a lot like the mice by colliding these in special ways, including uh, you know, many stars and gas and things like that. Uh, so we believe and observe that galaxies collide. We believe that all galaxies have supermassive black holes. So if galaxies collide, can collide, and they have supermassive black holes, those black holes can also eventually merge. And so the idea here is that you have two, here's another example of two merging uh, galaxies, and in the centers of those galaxies are these black holes, and again, we're representing uh, the gravitational ripples, the ripples in space-time uh, due to the motion of those two black holes in this green grid. And, and here it's a little spikier because these are supermassive black holes. The gravitation very close to them is extremely intense. And the idea is that those ripples travel out throughout the galaxy, although in this movie they seem to be uh, beamed conveniently toward the Milky Way, <laughs> which of course is Silly, that couldn't possibly be. Uh, and here we are on Earth with our radio telescope, and we observe pulsars, and as these ripples from distant merging supermassive black holes pass, uh, the uh, pulses are affected. So they can be a little blue shifted or red shift a little bit because um, of, the, of the delay or because of the changing space time between us and the pulsars. And so it's this effect that we're hoping to observe um, by creating what we call a pulsar timing array. The idea is we're going to have radio, we already have this in place, many radio telescopes around the Earth observing pulsars regularly, typically once a month. Uh, something like 30 to 40 pulsars right now are being observed typically once a month at radio telescopes around the world. So monitoring the signals from the pulsars, and the idea is by combining all the signals from the pulsars, Eventually, we're hoping we'll be able to detect gravitational waves from sources like merging supermassive black holes. We haven't done it yet, but we're hoping that this will be the next neutron star gift, uh, the de direct detection of gravitational waves. And this project is called the International Pulsar Timing Array, and uh, we just had a very interesting conference about this at McGill in the fall, and if you're interested, uh, you can Google the IPTA uh, or the North American branch of that, which is called Nanograv. So, so I've told you all sorts of cool stuff about pulsars, and we started at the end, so let's end at the beginning. Uh, cosmic gifts from pulsars. I hope I've shown you that these objects uh, have so much to offer us, uh, from pulsar music, which you got to enjoy tonight, uh, to providing perfect clocks uh, that allow us to do exquisite binary dynamics using binary pulsars, have allowed us to test 
relativistic theories of relativistic gravity, including general relativity, as well as rule out alternatives to general relativity. Uh, the double pulsar has provided some interesting tests, and hopefully soon to come, the next gift, uh, the direct detection of gravitational waves. Uh, and with that, I will thank you very much for your attention and also thank the many funding sources I have and my team of very hardworking graduate students and postdocs back at McGill University. So thank you very much. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was really good. So you can stand in the middle there. And we'll get Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll open the floor to questions both here in studio and online. And I see a question right here in studio. Let's start. Sure. Step to the mic. There you go. Okay. Um, so couldn't you use um, neutrino or muon emission to detect the neutron stars because it would be it would be so dense that like the particles wouldn't be able to get through because there's no space for them to get through. So you're asking a really, really good question. So particularly neutrinos. We think actually that neutron stars are very strong sources of neutrinos. Uh, we think that they emit them, especially when they're young and hot, that there's a lot of neutrino emission from the stars. Unfortunately, Given the sensitivity of detectors that can detect neutrinos, as you probably know, neutrinos are really hard to detect. They don't like to interact with things. Uh, it's really hard to detect. Uh, so we don't have any detectors that have any hope of detecting even the closest neutron stars. I wish we did, though. That would be amazing. Um, but couldn't you use some muons? So as far as I know, neutron stars are not big producers of muons. Probably no. they produce some. Oh, uh, sorry. I meant like n neutrons. No, not neutrons. Um, like the muons are coming from something behind it and you see like there's this big black spot because it's blocking all the muons from coming through. Right, I understand what you're saying. So look, even with, all, even with a few tens of thousands of neutron stars in the galaxy, that's still, space is still really, really big and they don't block very much of the sky. And muons, there's not very, there are muons that come, th uh, come from all sorts of objects in the in the galaxy, but the effect that you're describing, it's a great idea, but it, it, it hasn't been measured and I don't think it ever could, unfortunately. Sorry. Thank you, very, very good question. Yeah, great question. Absolutely. I'll go quickly to the, to the online questions here, and the question is this, does every neutron star end up emitting light beams and does the light, in quotation marks, come from the core? Ah, yes. So uh, the answer to the first question is every neutron star uh, produce light beams. The answer is no. So there is a class of neutron stars that doesn't produce uh, any of these beams. First of all, we think that uh, these pulsars uh, only pulsate for um, a certain lifetime. Different pulsars have different lifetimes. The typical lifetime, uh, 10 million, 100 million years. Millisecond pulsars can last billions of years, but the Eventually, most pulsars will turn off, and then uh, they, we, didn't, we, we don't think we can detect them in that case. So there are definitely class of neutron stars like that that are sort of dead pulsars. There's also young neutron stars in the galaxy that don't seem to produce these beams. We don't really know why. There's a couple of examples of those. Those are really curious objects that we don't fully understand. And the second question, remind me. Does it come from the core? Uh, yeah, so no. The, so, uh, so the beams of light that I described that from the, uh, the radio pulsar mechanism, no, that does not come from the core. Uh, we think that has to do with uh, particles accelerated in the uh, intense uh, electric fields uh, around in the magnetosphere. So these stars are very highly magnetized. If you take a magnetic field and you rotate it, that will produce intense electric fields, and electric fields love to uh, accelerate charged particles that will radiate, and so we think that kind of uh, mechanism is what's behind the beams of light. On the other hand, uh, heat from the core does uh, result in light from the whole surface. So we do see X-ray emission from some neutron stars, particularly young, very hot ones. And you could think of that light as coming from the core, but not the beamed emission. Thank you. Let's go back in studio right here. 
You said that the fastest moving pulsar is actually part of a cluster of pulsars that are all in the same area. Are they synergistic? Do they feed off of each other and help each other spin? Or is that just simply a coincidence that they happen to be in that same spot? Yeah, no. So that cluster of stars is, is actually, uh, it's a globular cluster that contains, uh, you know, between 100,000 and a million regular types of stars, normal stars. And so there's a few pulsars in there, um, and they're far, far enough apart that they, they can't communicate or they don't interact with each other. It's a, it's a nice idea, but uh, that it doesn't happen. They're, they're too far apart. Great, let's go in studio again. So most of the examples you showed us in neutron stars, they all appear in binary, in binary systems. Yeah. Why do they appear that way? So what is it about the binary system that allows these pulsars to form? Ah, uh, yeah, so I should, so of course, you know, the binaries are really wonderful for doing these um, types of dynamical experiments, and so they get a lot of airtime. but the truth is that uh, it's a tiny minority of all the known pulsars that are actually in binaries. So if we know of about 20, 2,000, so actually it's more almost 2,500 pulsars, uh, probably at most maybe 100 uh, binaries, maybe a little fewer more are known. Uh, and those pulsars represent the really, I, I like to think of them as the lucky guys who um, survived the, the explosion that created the pulsar. So in order to have the binary, so you know, the pulsars form from massive stars. Most massive stars are in binary systems. We know that from observations of massive stars. Um, so one star has a supernova explosion to produce the pulsar. Typically, that will unbind the, bi the binary. So the explosion is really powerful, and the binary doesn't, can't remain bound. So that's why most pulsars are isolated. But in certain favorable cases, that binary system uh, can be maintained and is not, uh, um, uh, is not disrupted. So those are the binaries that we observe. Uh, did, I, I hope I, did I answer your question? I guess, I guess a follow-up question is that, is the reason why binary pulsar systems are so interesting is because we can accurately measure the redshift and blue shift because they rotate about each other? Yeah, so that, that's, yeah, because we can use them to study dynamics. There's actually other reasons that I didn't get, uh, get to in this talk, but for example, if you want to understand stellar evolution, how stars evolve, uh, uh, and you want to understand, for example, the sources that uh, gravi gravitational wave detectors like advanced LIGO could one day detect, then you like to, then the people like who are interested in that will, will try and understand, well, what fraction of binaries will be disrupted? What fraction of binaries will produce double neutron star systems in the end? Uh, so there's actually a whole field of research in binary evolution. So there's binary dynamics, which is clean and, and uh, very mechanics oriented, has to do with, uh, you know, um, Newton's laws and general relativity, but then there's also the binary evolution. How do stars interact? How do stars uh, behave with each other? Uh, sometimes they can even transfer matter from one star to the other. There's all sorts of interesting interactions. That's a whole other field of research. Thank you. Great, let's go back to the online questions, and this one's sort of a nuanced gravity question. Okay. Can the rapid rotation inhibit the collapse of a star's core because of the bulge created by the rapid rotation? Would it prohibit uniform gravity? Ah, uh, yeah, so, so um, the, the r rotation in a stellar, in a progenitor star, in the massive star, that's not going to inhibit gravity. Gravity is really, really strong, and the rotation, maybe it will, um, you know, extend its lifetime for a very short period of time, but it's not going to inhibit the, uh, the collapse. Gravity is, is really, really strong. Um, on the other hand, it's exactly that bulge, uh, which then can d will ultimately define the maximum speed that a neutron star can rotate. Because even though a neutron star is so incredibly dense, if you spin it up you know, to close to, uh, you know, close to the speed of light, that bulge is going to form. The whole thing eventually will fly apart. So it's exactly the effect that the, the questioner is asking that um, helps us determine uh, the size of neutron stars and constrain how fast they can rotate. Great. Let's go back in studio. Go ahead. So you mentioned that there were like binary systems with a neutron star that's not a pulsar and a pulsar. Yeah. So how do you make sure like the neutron star is definitely not a pulsar and like can that be used in general to confirm that other neutron stars aren't pulsars? Right. So you know the way we can do it is just by going back to the radio telescope and observing it over and over and over again. And, uh, and the one thing I didn't tell you about the double pulsar, which you're going to find very interesting, is that pulsar B has disappeared. 
So it used to be a double pulsar. It is not a double pulsar anymore. <laughs> and that happened, uh, I don't know, two or three years ago. Uh, and we think what happened is, you know, I talked to you, I showed you this beautiful experiment where we used the eclipses to measure pulsar B's spin axis. And I said it was processing in agreement with general relativity. Well, if you process the pulsar spin axis too much, the beam doesn't hit you anymore. And so we think what happens is that it processed out of our line of sight. And if we could only move the Earth, you know, <laughs> a little bit, we would get to see it again. But we also think it will process back eventually. And estimates, we don't really know, but, uh, you know, in 100 years or something like that, it might one day return. So the answer to your question is you just have to keep observing it. And you never really know for sure, because perhaps with a bigger radio telescope and more sensitivity, we would detect faint pulsor, pulses that are there. Let's take one last question. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So this, has, it's a, the, this question has to do with the general dynamic of your presentations. So does your, uh, the size and the demographics of your audience change relative to how technical your talk is? And if so, how? Oh, <laughs> what an interesting question. Oh, I've never been asked something like that before. Does, yeah, so absolutely. So does the, are you saying, does the content change depending on the audience? Is that what you're asking? You repeat the question, I'm so blown away. That how, I... how, how does the size and the demographics of your audience change relative to how technical your talks are? While you're thinking that, I will tell you <laughs> that when we let Dr. Caspi know uh, how great of an audience you were, that, equation, that equations were okay, I think she dialed up the content. Uh, yeah, well, I, I've heard perimeter audiences are really excellent, so I, you know, uh, I, obviously, you know, if you want to make sure, if I go into an elementary school, then I'll, you know, talk a different, a different level. But if I'm talking to people who come to, <laughs> why don't we talk about this after? Because I'm not exactly <laughs> sure what uh, what you mean. Sure. Thank you very much. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Victoria Caspi. <laughs> that was awesome.